it's like I got this beautiful background for special effects with the snow coming down just as we're about to start the webinar. <laughs> and there's no snow out here, which speaks which to crazy. what we're talking about. It's about 55 degrees in Park City right now. Really? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna hit broadcast. Ash, you ready? Ready to go. Hello everyone and welcome to today's exclusive and rare one-on-one conversation between Michael Beckerman, CEO of Cretech and Brendan Wallace, co-founder and managing partner at Fifth Wall. My name is Ashkan Zandia, Cretech investor and member of the Cretech advisory board and I'm excited to be your host today. In a few minutes, we will hear from two of the most influential people leading the conversation on ESG, sustainability, and climate technology, and their monumental impact on the real estate industry. Throughout today's conversation, we will learn how the real estate industry can build to zero, as well as Fifth Wall's focus and strategies around climate change. Their climate impact fund, as well as the extraordinary collaboration between Cretech and Fifth Wall on the new Cretech Climate Platform launching in early February. That will exclusively focus on climate tech, sustainability, and ESG in the built world. Throughout today's conversation, throughout today's rare and exclusive conversation, one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one conversation, if you, our amazing audience, have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A button located at the bottom of, the, of your Zoom window. Please do not use the chat feature to submit questions. We will dedicate the last 15 to 20 minutes of today's webinar to answering your questions. So please submit your questions early and often. I see that we have a large number of people already logged in. So let's just kind of get this show on the road. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you my dear friend, Michael Beckerman. Mike and his team at Cretech host the largest events in real estate technology and the built world. With a mission on reimagining real estate, Mike has dedicated his professional life to the enhancement and growth of the real estate industry through innovative processes and technology. Please welcome my dear friend, Michael Beckerman. Mike, the stage is now yours, my friend. Thank you, Ash. And to those that might be looking at the photo of me uh, that don't know uh, <laughs> that well, it's the same guy, uh, <laughs> the one that you're seeing on the screen uh, previously and, and this guy, I figure, uh, and it's a subject of a lot of ridicule, the beard, let's just go there. No doubt, I'm enjoying it. I'm sure I'll get lots of comments from people that haven't seen me in a while. I figure uh, we're reinventing our company at Cretech. What might as well reinvent my look alongside of it. If I looked like Brendan, I wouldn't have to constantly keep changing, but. <laughs> well, for what it's worth, I, I think it deserves praise, not criticism. Well, you're, you're the, in the minority, my friend, but thank you. So a couple thoughts. Ash, got to acknowledge you, my friend, for your extraordinary support of Cretech, uh, but more importantly of our industry. And you continue to be such a wonderful voice, um, advocate, a uh, passionate uh, believer and networker for all things real estate tech. So just, I know you've got a lot of new things that you're working on, thrilled that you're still part of Cretech and uh, a leading voice in the industry. So uh, great to see you, my friend. I'm, and I'm humbled and honored, Mike. Thank you so much. So for those of you that maybe just came in from Mars and uh, don't know uh, Brendan and Fifth Wall, I just want to take a, a minute or two to sort of set the context of this conversation. So. As my team knows, I, I, I don't do a lot of these uh, sort of Zoom webinars. I kind of try to back out my profile a little bit just because I feel like the industry hears so much from me and I think there's far better people to talk about and wax poetically about all things real estate tech than me. So I, this is not something I do often or, or, or wanna do that much, honestly. Um, but this one was important to me. This one was one that I asked for. This was what I said to the team. I want to interview Brendan. I want to talk to him live. I want people to contribute and have questions. And I want to make this really engaging. For me, it being on this journey of real estate tech all these years, when 2017 came around and I got the call from uh, 
Natalie uh, over at Fifth Wall to meet uh, Brendan and his partner, Brad Grywe, in New York at a Starbucks. You know, it was, uh, how, do I, how do I draw an analogy? It was like watching the Beatles take the stage on Ed Sullivan. You know what I mean? It was like such a seminal moment in the history of real estate tech. Uh, the size of the fund, the caliber of the professionals, their background, it really was a game changer. And um, there are people that I personally look to for, you know, where the industry is going, what thoughts and themes I should be paying attention to, what our industry should be paying attention to. They've just had such a profound impact on our, on our sector. Yeah, they've, you know, the size of their, you know, assets under management is probably five plus times what it was when they raised their first fund at 200 million. You know, yeah, they've grown, but they've remained on the leading edge of our industry. And they're people that I consider really good friends. Brendan and I probably talk uh, once a week at least about what's happening in our industry. So for me, they're the bellwether of where things are going. So it was an important conversation I wanted to have. Obviously talk about fifth wall and spend most of the time talking about climate. I wanna use the conversation though to sort of shed some light on the real estate's uh, industry's impact on a climate change. And I think for me and a lot of other people, we were not aware of uh, the profound uh, impact that, it's, that we're having as a sector and what can we do about it? So for those reasons and more, it just really was important to me to spend some time with Brendan for our audience also to be able to participate. And so it's with great honor and, uh, and uh, respect that I, I introduce you to uh, Brendan Wallace, uh, co-founder of Fifth Wall. So Brendan, as you start every uh, <laughs> interview that you do, where do we find you today? Uh, I am in Park City, uh, envious of the amount of snow you have in your backyard because it's about 50 some odd degrees out here, which speaks to the consequences of I think what we're about to talk to today. Um, I also just wanna note uh, that CRE Tech, you know, thank you for the kind words about Fifth Wall. You should do this more often, Michael. Uh, I should, should have you do uh, our, our bio more often. But I, I just want to highlight, because I do think it's relevant for what we're going to talk about in Time at Tech, which is that Fifth, you mentioned that we met in 2017. The prop tech as a, as a category and as a trend was a foot well before then. And you were really at the vanguard of it. And it was firms like Fifth Wall that maybe institutionalized a lot of the capital around that. But the, the kind of vanguard position you sat in, I think is very parallel to exactly what's happening with climate tech and real estate today. And I hope we talk about that um, because I hope this conversation feels like that conversation back in 2017 with respect to climate tech. But thank you so much for having me, Michael. And uh, again, I love everything that you guys do and contributing to the ecosystem. And um, we're just so thrilled to be partnered. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, my friend. So let's just jump in. Before we jump into the climate, I thought we'd sort of, let me just uh, outline what I'd like to do uh, today in, in our conversation. The first part of the conversation, I'd love to talk a little bit about just fifth wall and uh, just a quick look back and then a look forward to some of the things that the, the fund in general is, is, is working on and focused on. And then I'd like to uh, focus uh, obviously on climate and then leave a good, good chunk of room for Ash to moderate a wonderful Q&A with our audience. So let me start by just you know, jumping right in. You know, for, for most of us, uh, 2020 was uh, you know, a year of, of, of tremendous um, you know, challenges, right? There's so many businesses that, that unfortunately in all, all businesses, all industries did not make it. Others like ours, you know, we had to reinvent, which we're accustomed to, and, uh, and we have successfully, thanks to my wonderful team. And others scaled. When you think about or you reflect on 2020 for Fifth Wall, what, what are some of the thoughts that come to mind? What kind of year was it for the, the firm? Um, maybe I'll answer that a bit around real estate tech and then a bit specific to us, because in some ways, were a, you know, a lagging indicator to what's happening in prop tech. But you know, the real estate industry, as we've long talked about, has been a very slow adopter of technology, right? They've been a tech laggard. I mean, you could almost say that they missed the entire internet and all of mobile up until like maybe 2010, when there was this kind of age of enlightenment in the real estate industry. But the one thing that kind of girded that reluctance 
to adopt tech was the assumption that tomorrow would be like today and today would be like yesterday. There was a continuity that people wanted office space in cities. People were going to travel. People were going to do things in physical space because that is ultimately what the real estate industry is. It's just the monetization of physical space. That's real estate, definitionally. And there was an assumption that the future would look like the past. And what 2020 did is it tugged at that anchor, at that, at that assumption. I'm not sure it di disrupted it, is too far a word, but it was a healthy tug at that assumption. And so I think a lot of real estate owners, especially in the office industry and the retail industry, got a glimpse to how fast the world is moving and their inaction or complacency or reluctance to adopt technology was made clear to them. And so we've seen tremendous progress, obviously, in prop tech funding, right? When we started Fifth Wall, the numbers were around $4 billion going to prop tech. Last year was around $32 billion. So we're in this moment of just massive growth. But at the same time, so much of what we struggle with and what the whole industry struggles with is like, how do you create that urgency? How do you create that expediency to adopt technology? And I think 2020 shone a light on the fact that if you do things like you've always done them in the past, you probably won't be here too much longer in the future. And tech is a huge part of that. Climate and sustainability is as well. But to me, that's the big lesson of 2020. And so as that relates to Fifth Wall, um, we are a beneficiary of that in some sense, right? Because our, our vision, our mandate is to help large real estate incumbents engage with the innovation economy, adopt new technologies, partner with new technologies that can change their business. And to do that, you need the right psychology at that corporate. You need a willingness to change. And that healthy tug at, at kind of the anchor of what has characterized the real estate industry for the last hundred years, I think is a real tailwind to tech adoption. Yeah, I mean, you and I have talked, I could agree more that I feel like we saw a 10x acceleration of adoption in 2020 in terms of, of real estate technology, because as you said, they, they were forced to. So um, I think there's a lot of uh, you know uh, important trends that 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 have really uh, developed. And, and by the way, Michael, there's one other thing which I think is also so interesting that I was talking from the perspective of real estate CEOs and real estate companies themselves. But the other interesting thing that shifted in 2020 is consumers and right. tenants right. started to see real estate companies as something more than real estate companies for the first time. Like if you went back to January of this year, who out there was thinking about air quality indoors and how much of a effect their landlord standards around ventilation has on their own public health or right. whether you're shutting down an office or not shutting down an office, how that intertwines with issues of public health and ethics. Like those were questions that were just thrust on the real estate community. And everyone, it feels like now understands, real estate is so enmeshed in our lives. It's, it's, it's where we live, it's where we work, it's where we do business, it's where we make things. And I think that realization has a strong parallel to what we're gonna talk about today, which is real estate is the culprit that's been hiding in plain sight around the climate crisis. And I think the world is waking up to that reality, much in the same way they woke up to the reality of how consequential their landlord is mm -hmm. in their own personal health and public health broadly. Right. No, I, I absolutely. And we'll jump into that. Uh, we'll, we'll pull on that thread in a minute. Let's just, just spend a, a, a couple minutes getting your thoughts about 2021 for Fifth Wall and the sector as a whole. You know, we've seen some, uh, you know, some companies you know, march to IPO successfully. Congratulations on announcing your, your new SPAC, which I know at this stage, you can't really get into specifics about. Um, you know, we're getting the sense there's some big M&A in the works. What, what are your thoughts just in general about real estate technology in 2021, in the, in the, specifically to the sector? It's now unequivocally a thing. You know, I think when, uh, with all due respect, when, when you started CRE Tech, when we started Fifth Wall, we were considered fringe at best in yeah. the venture ecosystem that 
you know, people would ask us when we were fundraising, what is real estate tech? I don't even know what that means. Um, and this word prop tech was just coming in vogue and kind of popular parlance. And we would have to explain that, well, this industry is 13% of the US economy. It's a tech laggard. It's done really inefficient. Basically everything that the industry does is analog and it's about to change because if that industry spends what other industry spends on technology, it's gonna be massive. Yeah. Anyone who doesn't get that at this point, I don't know, hasn't, hasn't been reading the news, has been asleep at the wheel because I think you could argue that real estate tech is now one of, if not the largest industry category of venture. I mean, Open Door, yeah. Tempo, Blend, like these companies are massive because yeah. the TAMs are so huge. So I do think we've seen a crystallization uh, or a recognition that real estate tech is definitionally going to be just like the real estate industry is the largest industry in the United States probably the largest component of venture capital, real yeah. estate. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Could agree, obviously, more. So now let's let's uh, shift our focus to climate. My first question for you really is more of a personal nature. You know, we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago um, on, uh, you know, your Fly on the Wall uh, series, which I was um, fortunate to have participated in you know, about my sort of awakening to the real estate's culpability in uh, climate change. And it was such an epiphany. I mean, for me, as somebody that, you know, you know lives on a part-time on a farm uh, in the country that is, you know, uh, very, very passionate about climate and yet very, my whole 30-year career in real estate, it was sort of an awake. it wasn't sort of, it was an awakening for me. When we did our sustainability summit together and to, 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 to learn about real estate's impact. And it's, so it's galvanized me personally, and I'm incredibly passionate about making a difference for the world and my children, future generations. That's my story. What's your story? Why is this so important to you that you are devoting so much time, energy to climate when there's so many opportunities, I'm sure that are coming at you personally every single day at Fifth Wall and, and, and beyond? Well, maybe I'll answer that in terms of how I got to the idea and then why it compelled me. But how I got to the idea was I didn't start Fifth Wall. When Brad and I started Fifth Wall, the thesis wasn't, hey, let's decarbonize the real estate industry. It was instead, let's transform the real estate industry by ensuring that it adopts the technology that's required to see it into the future. That was the vision. And I would almost say, expressly at the very beginning of fifth law, I was like, I don't know climate tech. And we were seeing some of it. We would get inbound deals and I would say, I don't have the expertise in this. And so when you look at you know, our first fund, it's a lot of FinTech companies around the residential home purchase transaction and a lot of commercial real estate technology around systems, right? And kind of um, pure enterprise software. But climate tech was never really a part of it. And then, about a year ago, um, as we were just having conversations with real estate corporates, more and more I would see an interest. And I was kind of gleaning that, that there was a gestating interest in climate tech at these corporates, but they didn't know what to do. And so I started to ask questions and I would ask real estate corporates, well, what are you doing around sustainability? And to be totally honest, Michael, the answers rub me the wrong way. I know when I'm being fooled and I know when I'm being, what you would say today in the sustainability space is greenwashed. Mm. And I was being greenwashed. I would talk to real estate corporates and they would say, I would ask them, what are you doing about this? And they would say, well, I'm, um, I have gardens on my roofs. Right. My buildings. And I'd be like, come on. Like, even I know that does nothing. Like, that's great. So some tomatoes grow on your roof, but like, who cares? Um, that's decorative. It's definitely kind of consumery and meme-like, but that's not decarbonization. And when I looked across the real estate ecosystem, I saw an enormous amount of talk. And so I'm always curious and uh, I almost kind of took on the role of like investigative journalist. And I was like, let me find out how much money these real estate corporates are actually committing to this space. Like, does the money parallel where the words are? Right. To skip to the punchline, it doesn't. 
it's actually shocking how how big a void there is. Real estate corporates talk an enormous amount. They they win self-appointed awards. They they win these decorative credentials around how, but no one can verify it. And that's very deliberate. It's it's designed to be obtuse and hard to understand, but makes a consumer or a tenant feel like they're doing a lot. And so when I thought about that more, I said, I think there's a real parallel here with what happened in prop tech, right? Mm -hmm. Like three years ago, which is that there's a lot of talk, a lot of bluster, but I don't see, I don't see anything institutional. I don't, I don't see real dollars moving. That was the genesis of fifth law back in the day. It was like these corporates dabbling in venture capital, they're not going to do it right. well. These family offices, they're not going to do it well. Let's institutionalize it and do it big and do it well and do it with an exceptional team. And that was hard work to stand up. And I think it proved to work. And so when I looked at climate tech, I was like, this is history repeating itself. And then at an ethical level, for me, the reason it resonated is I really liked it because I, I, I never liked the ESG construct. Whenever people start talking about ESG, it actually bugs me. I know. We talk, yep. And the reason is, is that E is a gigantic science and physics problem. It is solvable. Like just to skip to the chase, we can decarbonize our economy. It is a science problem. It is achievable. S and G, social justice issues, demographics, those are very complicated. And people actually have differing, like viable and differing points of view on how to solve them. There are no differing points of view when it comes to decarbonizing the environment. There's people that deny science and people that accept science. And so what I really liked about this is I was like, this is a problem that can be solved with enormous amounts of money and institutionalization and collective action. And I like to think that's what Fifth Wall is good at. Um, so I said, well, our superpower as an organization is the ability to convene the real estate industry, raise, raise, raise big pools of capital, have institutional investors deploying that to solve problems. That's solvable. So the E in ESG, I think I can take head on and I feel good about that. Yeah. And so I deliberately tried to disambiguate the E from ESG and that, and that be our focus for this fund. Beautiful. That's wonderful. So let's let's get some uh, specificity on what I get questions a lot, and I, you're far more eloquent than I to answer this one. What is climate tech? Climate tech is technology to decarbonize real estate. Um, so that can mean any number of things, right? Um, and just like prop tech, it can mean any number of things. So um, in prop tech, I think when at first launch, it was very narrowly defined. It was like technology that was used by a building owner in a building. And then it started to morph out and it got into FinTech and it got into data and analytics and it even got into transportation, right? Like we did line out of our first fund and we regarded that as prop tech, right? Um, the same is true of climate tech. So there's climate tech that's super intuitive to people, right? So solar, right? That is alternative energy technology that you can put on your roof, it's technology. And I think everyone would agree that's climate tech. But what about smart building technology, right? Technology that actually tracks the behavior of tenants within a building. On the one hand, it's as useful data, that's all you do with it. But if it actually changes the energy consumption within a building, that can be climate tech. And there's regulatory and reporting tech. We're probably gonna talk about all the new regulations that are imminent for the real estate industry. You're gonna need an enormous amount of technology to report on that. There's on-site battery technology. There's materials technology, like real physics-based technology around glass and drywall and concrete. So climate tech is the, the corpus of all of that. But it is, in my mind, it is technology and new companies whose express purpose is to decarbonize the real estate industry. And that is exactly why we started our climate tech fund. We said. There's no fund that's doing this. There's no fund that's focused on this. This is a way to deploy capital into that space. So, right. And I think the parallels between, as, you, as you've said many times about the quote unquote prop tech, you know, what that looked like six, seven, eight years ago compared to today on climate tech, the parallels are extraordinary. Um, and I actually believe, and we've talked about this, that this will be a much bigger market than quote unquote prop tech uh, because it just touches so much in terms of the built world. 
I would love for you to tell the audience, because it was a shock to me, and I read all the literature that you guys put out, and it's wonderful. Um, the, you know, the real estate, the built world's impact on climate. Uh, I mean, again, you're, you're, looking, you're talking to a 35-year veteran of this industry, and I had no effing idea. My 13-year-old is doing a report in school about real estate's impact <laughs> on climate. I mean, she, and, you know, of course, she's far more educated and brighter than I am. The younger generation knows, right? Give us some statistics. Give us some factoids about the real estate industry's impact. Well, it's a great question because it's usually so counterintuitive to people, right? When you think of who are the villains in the climate crisis, you think of oil, coal, oil, uh, coal, exactly, transportation, shipping, plastic, right? Like th that is that is what we, we conjure up as the villains in the climate crisis. Shocking stat. If you added up probably all those industries combined, the real estate industry would be worse. I don't know that as a fact, but it's certainly more than any one of those industries individually. So anyone in the real estate industry, you are part of the single most contributive industry to the climate crisis without a doubt. Now, a lot of people in the sustainability space recognize this and know this. Most consumers don't, right? So they believe that it's actually the plastic straw manufacturers or it's actually the automotive industry that is that will change. So the real estate industry will have a spotlight shown on it and the stats are shocking. So the real estate industry is responsible for 39% of all CO2 emissions, 39%. You just gotta stop there and just like let that breathe. 39%. It's just, it speaks for itself, right? Like, and it, it shouldn't be that surprising when you think about it, like at a, at an intellectual level, because you're like, well, we generate CO2 from operating our economy. Our economy happens indoors, largely. Our economy happens in buildings. Mm -hmm. Those buildings are responsible for the CO2 emissions. The other thing is raw materials, embodied carbon. The real estate industry consumes 30% of all the raw materials in the world. So the real estate industry is the single biggest contributor to the climate crisis. And I think what the real estate industry is not prepared for is a spotlight being shown on it. Because today, 23% of Fortune 500 companies have very public, very visible decarbonization pledges. I don't see a lot in the real estate industry. Like meaning, just to put it in perspective, Google, has committed to being carbon neutral. And it's not to suggest that Google doesn't have a big contribution to the climate crisis, but basically it's a search engine with some ads, right, and servers. It's not even comparable, not even comparable to a real estate developer. And they have done so. Mm -hmm. So the real estate industry, I think, doesn't have that much time to catch up and to quote, get their act together and get their house in order and have a proactive plan. And I think it's, you know, th th there, there's been a number of different imperatives as to why to do so. There's the ethical imperative, right? Do you care about the planet? Do you care about your grandchildren? Of like, this is the right thing to do. There's also now a very real economic imperative. Like we are now reaching the point where this is actually good business mm -hmm. for real estate companies. And the third thing is regulators and capital markets now recognize this as well. And real estate is very subject to, real, to local taxes, as we know, and it's very subject to changes in capital markets, as we know. And so it now sits at the epicenter of these huge psychographic changes in the world in regulators and capital markets and uh, in the public's mind. Yeah, demographic. Address. Right, right, right. Demographics in terms of... Uh you know, the younger generation that this is imperative. I mean, you oh. know, it, it, it's, it determines where they work, where they live, who they want to work with. I mean, it's all about social conscience and, uh, and responsibility as a, as a corporate citizen. You know, I, I think, you know, the thing that I still struggle with, and I'd love for you to sort of, you know, just um, talk about what is it going to take though, right? 
you know, I, we read so much about, you know, you know, Larry Fink's letter was, you know, a seminal moment in getting corporate America to wake up to it. You know, you've got Amazon's climate pledge. Uh, interestingly enough, their first investment, I think, was in a concrete uh, 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 technology company. You know, every day, they're, particularly in Europe, they're talking about uh, standards and, and measurement. Uh, it's, 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 you know, the basis of a lot of investment thesis. But what's it going to take for the real estate industry to say, you know, we need to now not just be an advocate, but to produce measurable change and progress in reducing carbon emissions so that, because I don't know how as a society, obviously, we get, you know, to carbon neutral, to, to net zero by 2050 without the real estate industry. We can't, right? What's going to get us, I say us as the collective there? So $18 trillion <laughs> is the number. Uh, roughly to decarbonize the real estate industry for its ratable share of CO2 emissions, it's going to take about $18 trillion. Now, one of the things that is very confusing to a lot of people is that when you ask the real estate industry, how are you investing in climate tech? there's this conflation that goes on between buying and deploying existing technology and investing in new technology. And it's a very important distinction. And here's why. The technology that exists today, the very best technology that exists today, if a building owner were to deploy all of it within a building, it only gets them about 50% of the way there towards operational net zero. So with the best stuff we've got today, so if we hook our buildings up, we only get about halfway there. And we should, we should definitely try to get halfway there. That is a question of deployment and infrastructure and investing in getting new solar, uh, geothermal battery technologies into buildings. But we still have 50% to go. And so what the real estate industry and what the world, frankly, is betting on is that investors deploy R&D capital into technologies that can close that gap. So that is the important distinction, that there is a big distinction between deployment, which gets you halfway there, and investment in R&D, which is the other half. Do you know how much the real estate industry has invested in R&D? as an industry over the last 10 years. I think you do know because- we've I do, I'm just afraid to ask. So you, I, I know the answer and it's, uh, it's shockingly uh, inadequate and uh, disappointing, but- um, It's a hundred million bucks. Yep. That's like a sixth of a building in New York, right? It's, it's, it's nothing, it's de minimis. It's an interest payment for some landlords. So the fact that the real estate industry has invested so little is the structural problem. Now, a lot of real estate owners come to us and say, well, I'm a landlord. Uh, why should I be investing in this stuff? And honestly, this is where the parallel from prop tech is so resonant. It's like, well, why should you invest in prop tech? Well, the reason you should invest in prop tech is that you're rooting for these technologies and you want to accelerate the pace at which they're developed. And in getting access to them earlier and in accelerating the pace of their development, you get to deploy sooner and you get to reduce your carbon sooner and the world benefits and you benefit and regulators are less upset. There is a virtuous cycle to taking this action. And it's not that much that's required. Um, you know, Fifth Wall's goal with this fund is very ambitious. Like we wanna put probably close to half a billion dollars in right. to r and into this space. That's and right. I think that's really not that much for landlords, that's really not that much because the problem has such a scale and a magnitude that's shocking. So the key question, and I think this, you know, a lot of people here, obviously, that are listening to this, that, that are focused on prop tech, but the key question to always ask when you're talking to a landlord, when they say, I invest a lot in sustainability, is what do you mean by investing? Right. Does that mean you bought someone's technology? You right. bought someone's battery technology and put it in your building? Because that's a great thing, but that's not investing, that's buying technology. We need to bet on technological progress. That is what we all need to get behind. That's R&D, that's venture capital, and right now it's not happening. And, and that's what it's And measure it. 
And measuring, exactly. It, and and the, all those things are cyclical, meaning the more R&D that goes in, the more efficient those technologies become, the faster the payback periods, the higher the ROIs, the more imminently adoptable those technologies become for real estate landlords. So th this is virtuous, but it requires doing something different than what you did in the past. Yeah, clearly. And I, uh, you know, for me, and I'm thrilled that we've announced, uh, you know, our partnership together in launching Creek Tech Climate, which hopefully will go to market within a few weeks and it'll, it'll replicate everything that we did for uh, on Cretech as being a voice and an advocate. And I, I can't thank Fifth Wall enough for helping us launch this and being our, our, our joint venture partner on it. And I'm super excited by it. We're gonna go out, we're gonna build a community and we're gonna shed a lot of light on what's happening in terms of climate. And um, you know, we'll be an advocate, we'll be a voice, but we don't have time, right? I don't have, I don't have the five, six years that it took to build Cretech. We just don't have it, you know? Um, so what I struggle still with is, you know, we've got Fifth Wall, there's some other great firms that are investing in, in climate tech around the world, right? Um, we saw Hank Paulson now joining climate tech as an investor, um, former treasury secretary. We see companies like Prologis and Oxford and uh, Savills and EY as uh, advocates and, and making meaningful investments. But how are we going to galvanize the rest of the industry, though, to feel this sense of urgency? Is it going to take more cities like New York and L.A. to actually regulate, mandate, retrofitting in all new buildings, you know, adhere to certain um, standards? It, 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 you know, is it going to take sort of measurement? Is it going to take incentives? How are we going to accelerate this faster than we did on prop tech? I think that I have a few answers to that. And maybe I'll start with what's closest to home, which is like, what can we do? Well, I mean, me and you, Michael. Yeah. And I think it's, we can ask the right questions. And so we've talked about this, but I think there should be a survey of the whole real estate industry that says, how much are you investing in the climate tech? Yeah, we're doing when real estate owners like answer that. We say, how much are you investing into R&D? And I think the answer is going to be shocking. Now, there are some exceptions. You noted them, like Prologis is actually making investments into the space. The vast majority, my guess is the median is zero. The median is zero. It's just not happening. And so you and I should do that, Michael, but everyone listening to this call, when they talk to their heads of sustainability and they talk about gardens on roofs, right? You should ask, how much is going into R&D from right. your balance sheet? Because that garden on a roof, that's BS. Right. We both know that. And the right. fact that you deployed solar, that's good, but not enough. Right. How much is going into R&D? So the first is we need to ask the right questions. The second thing I think is actually already happening um, is regulators are getting smart for this, right? So for the last four years, we've lived under the single most environmentally regressive federal administration, the Trump administration. No, um, no, no, never, no, my friend, no argument here. Yeah, and that's about to change, right? In a few days. What's happened in the last four years is that cities have put their cities right back in the pair of standards. And they have carbon neutrality laws and they have carbon fines. So it's coming at a local level. And now with a federal overlay, it's gonna come very fast because the, the Biden administration's ambitions are fantastic ambitions, but they're about two and a half to three decades too late. So they have a, it's a five alarm fire. So it's gonna come hard and it's gonna come fast on the real estate industry, for sure. The other thing is capital markets. You called it out. Right now, capital markets are saying, real estate owners have to decarbonize. We're gonna preferentially deploy capital. We're gonna insure assets that are low or no carbon footprint real estate. That's happening and real estate owners are getting smart to that. In some sense, that is also one of the one of the impetuses between why I'm hearing more about this, which is if you're a real estate CEO, you are concerned about your cost of capital. Absolutely. What's happening today is going to pale mm -hmm. in, in comparison to what exists two, three years from now. So if you think that people are asking hard questions today, just wait for 2023, right? The pitchforks are coming for the real estate industry. Um, and the last thing, by the way, is tenants. Like yeah. the real estate industry, in the end of the day, it's tenants, right? They pay the bills. And tenants 
have now their own requirements. Tenants are saying, we need low or no carbon footprint real estate or we won't lease from you. And so meaning if you have a building that has no energy efficiency standard, that's going to be as valuable as a building with no roof. Like literally, it's right. going to be non-economic. It's non-viable. You can't rent it. Right. So all these things are happening. What I think is incumbent on us in the tech ecosystem is to really call attention to this R&D shortfall and really, really call out the real estate industry because each individual real estate owner doesn't need to do that much to have a massive impact on this. That's, that's, that's it, man. That, that's so well said. And I think, you know, the takeaway for me, and, you know, it's what we've talked about, it's what our collective organizations are working on, is we've got to, we've got to uh, measure it, you know. We've got, we got to have the surveys, but we've also got to quantify it. So it doesn't just become some PR BS where somebody could say, you know, here's the symbol, here's the seal that I've got, you know, that I could put on my building. You know, look, I've got it. I'm not going to mention the specific seals that are out there, but we've got to go beyond that because we just don't simply have the time anymore. And that. you should publicize it. Like, yeah, absolutely. Do you remember this, this kind of meme where they were talking, it existed on social media where they were talking about awful authoritarian dictators and that we should make them more famous and more well-known than they are. Clearly a high carbon impact real estate owner is not nearly as nefarious as that, that's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that the principle right. of celebritizing the inaction of certain real estate owners is a good thing because it is in itself a call to action. Yes. And so I would love to see climate tech do that survey yes. and put that survey out and have some of the biggest logos in the real estate industry at the top of that list for having contributed zero right. to R&D because that will, that will change behavior. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, you know, I think that uh, for me as well and for our company, you know, this, is, this was not something that we went into because we thought we could build a, a big, you know, business. It's not something we're checking a box, it's personal. You know, it's personal for me. It's incredibly important to me that whenever uh, I leave this planet, uh, you know, that I made a difference, right? I, 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 I want to help be as helpful as I can. I want to, you know, continue uh, my Buddhist nature that to be um, uh, a force of good, but I also want to leave a measurable impact. So I think the more that we can do to get companies Yes, motivated, educated, but to quantify it, to measure it. Uh, and I think that survey is a great idea. We're going to do it. Uh, um, and I think, you know, this is an opportunity for the real estate industry to become one of the most admired, respected, consequential industries in the world. I mean, I can't tell you now it's starting, you know, that we announced the Cretec climate with Fifth Wall and a couple others are coming on board. So I'm super excited to announce the amount of college kids that are reaching out to me saying, I want to get involved. This is the future that I want to make. This is the career path I want to take. So I remain, I'm, I'm somewhat daunted by the task, to be honest. I know it, but I've got the energy. I've got the passion. I've got the commitment. So I'm hopeful and I will put my neck and my name and our reputation and our company out there to do it. My final question for you, my friend, I want to get to the audience. Are you hopeful? I am hopeful. Um, and, and one of the reasons I'm hopeful is that I see in conversations like this, I see in partnerships like the one we have, that there's an opportunity to bring together these various different constituent components that are required to affect change. So just to be clear, fifth wall is not enough. I can be as successful as I hope to be and fifth wall and all of my action will not be sufficient on its own. What we need is media attention on it as well. And that's, I think, what is so profound about and potentially impactful about our partnership. But it's more than that. We need regulators to also see the light. We need capital markets to see the light. We need tenants to see the light. We need consumers to see the light. And what I'm seeing are positive and proactive movements in these groups um, and a shift away from the kind of hand wavy, greenwashy, 
just kind of decorative nonsense that has heretofore characterized the real estate industry's commitment to sustainability and real hard questions being asked by all of those constituents. And so the very partnership that I think we're entering into, Michael, um, I think more groups will come on board. Like what I'm hopeful is that what, 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 what Siri Climate can become is not just a partnership between the biggest venture capital fund in the space, but a partnership between the largest tenant organizations and consortiums of mayors and consortiums of major capital allocators and consortiums of concerned citizens. And they all start to come together and information is flowing transparently, uh, capital is moving efficiently and consumer behaviors are happening rationally in a way that moves this forward. And so, you know, it, it goes back to where we started the conversation, which is so much of what made prop tech um, hard in the beginning and why we've, I think, been so, it, the, the position it's in now is so exalted in the, in the venture community is because we've partially overcome this collective action problem. And so when you ask me when I'm optimistic, I would say, the question is, am I optimistic that we can overcome this collective action problem when it comes to climate tech investing? And my answer is yes. My intuition is that we will. And my intuition, Michael, is that you and I will have a big part in overcoming that static friction. Amen. <laughs> well, we'll be right alongside uh, you, you, Brendan. I thank you so much for your time and articulating your, your important vision. And uh, I don't know, you know, I could tell you, honestly, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, meaning we wouldn't be having this conversation. So uh, keep advocating, keep pushing, and we'll do our best uh, at Cretech to keep up with you and you inspire us. And uh, uh, you know, myself and the team, uh, Ash obviously included, we're, we're super excited about um, what we're gonna do together to change, uh, change the world. So thanks my friend, Ash, all you, my friend, I see I went a little over, but you know, I get carried away obviously. As I'm so passionate about this topic and talking to Brandon, I feel like you know we're on one of our private chats. I forget that there's people listening that have questions and they're piling up. So I'm going to shut yes, up. Yes, Mike, up. Brendan, this has been awesome and and def very enlightening. And we have uh, some really great questions. Uh, the first question, you know, we, we kind of touched upon it. Um, the counterintuitive nature of the real estate industry as it relates to CO2 admission and, and the greater uh, conversation around sustainability. Uh, from an owner operator's perspective, you know, across all the asset classes, um, you know, how, how are some of your biggest advocates justifying the, the expense portion of it, um, uh, 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 the, the ROI uh, calculations, if you will, when it comes to this, uh, when it comes to sustainability? Um, it's, it's a very good question. And I, I think I understand where the question is rooted. The implication yeah. of the question is that a lot of these technologies um, do not today have sufficiently high ROIs or fast enough payback periods to be justifiable in a conventional carbon-driven energy ecosystem for the real estate industry? I think that's the question. Yeah. Um, and the answer is that the future is not gonna look like the past. Um, and the second part of my answer is that those ROIs and those payback periods are partially in our control. So let me unpack both of those. One is, it's not just that the, if you look at an individual technology, you look at installing on-site batteries, you, you have to look at the payback period today. Because if you're looking at it in 2021, what you're not looking at is, does your cost of capital change if you don't do this in 2023? Do fines from local and federal regulators start rolling in over the next decade if you don't do this today? And if people don't want to lease your building because you don't do this today. And my guess, strong guess, borderline certainty, is that when those ROI calculations are being run today, they are not including that. They are operating just like we started this conversation under the assumption that I think 2020 should have jarred loose, that the future and tomorrow 
is going to look like yesterday. And when it comes to sustainability, it will not for the real estate industry. It will not. So your calculations that you ran last year are wrong. They're wrong. So that's one thing. The second part of the question is that you can change that. Fifth Wall has a climate tech fund. We're investing into these very technologies to improve their ROIs, to improve their payback periods, to improve how readily adoptable they are to real estate corporates. So don't complain about it, right? Do something about it. Um, so I, I, I think it's a really valuable question. It's a question we get asked a lot, but I think I would answer it in those two ways. And I think the real estate industry, when they hear those two answers, they know that what I'm saying is right. They know that it's right. Because anyone who's lived through any economic peer, any period of economic history knows the only constant is change. Mm. And we are in a period of existential crisis for our planet. Regulators, tenants, consumers, other real estate owners, they're getting it. And if you're not getting it, you are on the wrong side of history. And the wrong side of history is economically and ethically unforgiving. So this isn't just a very small decision. This could be an existential decision for your real estate company today, based on what you think about what the world's gonna look like five years from today. I love your boldness. I love your, and I admire the passion, Brendan. I, I, it just really comes through. It really comes through. I, and I see Mike nodding and smiling. I, I can only imagine, if, I, I wish I was a fly on the wall with your conversations, to be honest with you, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> this was Ash. This is exactly what they're Yeah. <laughs> we have a question from Ben. Um, he asks, are particular areas of the industry better or worse when it comes to tracking sustainability and climate issues, or is it an individualistic thing? Is it an individualistic issue? It's too individualistic today. Um, we need better standards. We need better reporting. That, that is partially a technology problem. It's also partially a regulatory problem and the kind of schizophrenia of having a federally regressive environmental administration and environmentally progressive local administrations. So um, what we should have is real clear standards. And just to be clear, what I'm focused on and what I hope Michael and I focus on is one part of the problem. It is not a panacea, it's not a solution. Like real estate owners have to invest in R&D. That's sure as rain. And the ones that don't won't be here in five years. That I feel very confident in. But even if all of them did it, it wouldn't be enough. So other people out there, right? Other people that are committed to this problem should be focused on deployments, right? And how efficiently these real estate owners are deploying. And other people should be focused on new construction and the standards of new construction. And they are, and we're seeing it. So as impassioned as you're hearing this conversation, which is around one part of the problem, I hope and am optimistic that other entrepreneurs, other media companies, other groups out there are equally impassioned about other constituent solutions that we need to solve this holistically. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, another question came in from, from Joseph. He asks, where is fifth wall like we can't talk we can't talk about th just the uh the the food groups of real estate without talking about construction construction leads to the built world uh, they create the built world um what is your take on the construction construction technology industry as it relates to sustainability uh it's critical that we build more energy efficient and lower embodied carbon new buildings. That's clear. And there's a lot of people that are focused on this and it's very good. I'm very happy that they are. Here's the problem and why I think new construction alone and embodied carbon represents somewhat of a false profit. The bulk of the buildings that the world is gonna do the economy in over the next 30 years until we have to meet the Paris standard are already built. Mm -hmm. They're already built. The CO2, the embodied carbon that was required to build them, it's already in the air. It's already in the environment. It's already doing damage today. We can't put that genie back in the bottle. And so even if we built as fast as we're hoping to replace all these new buildings, we wouldn't get there off new construction alone. 
It's a huge part of the problem is fixing what's already been built today. I know that's not as sexy. I know it's not as enticing. I know the idea of making a pre-war building in New York City, in New York City, energy efficient, is brutal. It's very complicated. It's very challenging. It's far less cool than reading articles about new green buildings built in the Netherlands that you know are carbon, basically suck carbon out of the environment. Of course, of course, like we are rooting for that as well. But I think that there has been too much focus on new construction and not enough on retrofitting. And so to be clear, our focus is both. We do care about both. But a very small portion of the usable square footage in which the U US economy happens is new, yeah. built in the last few years. That's a great very, point. very small percentage. Such an important point for the audience to hear, Brennan. And it's also why I think places like New York have mandated uh, retrofitting as well, right? I think it's New York, LA, and, and many, many others. Not just the yep. new stock, it's the old stock. And as an aside, retrofitting takes a lot of technology, it takes a lot of money, and it creates a lot of jobs. And if you think the Biden administration isn't focused on those three things, especially the latter, on jobs, you're wrong. And the best way to drive retrofitting is to establish new federal standards, standards that look like Europe, that look like the Paris standards. So it's coming and jobs are a major driver of it. But I, I love the question. I don't mean to be dismissive of the importance of new construction because it's incredibly important. It's just that that's not the whole solution. Um, and I do think we've seen construction companies, contractors, materials companies take really positive proactive steps but I'm fearful that that might distract us from the other 98% of the problem, which is the buildings we already have in the ground today. Where, where we currently live, work, shop, the whole, yes, absolutely. Ash, I, I don't yeah. think I've seen so many questions. On I know, I know, and they're coming. And, and I don't know we, we, all, we off, unfortunately though. have time for one more. Um, uh, this question comes in from Connie. It's, it's a two part question. Uh, first, uh, what perspectives can you offer on the residential sector within the real estate industry in the context of tackling its climate impact? By residential, that means a lot of different things. I think for the sake of this question, we'll narrow it down to single family uh, and not multifamily because I think we'll, we'll, we'll bundle commercial and multi together. So for this commerce, uh, the comments of this question, we'll say only residential, single family. And the second part to that question is, how will we actually find and develop the talent required to support this acceleration? Great. Two really good questions. And I know I don't have that much time, so I'll, I'll try to take them on quickly and succinctly. Um, when it comes to single family homes, there's been a lot of initiatives around changing consumer behavior and consumer demand to want more sustainable things from Priuses to more energy efficient homes. I'm strongly supportive of all of that, but I don't think it's sufficient. I don't think we can rely on everyone to potentially make a non-economic decision simply because of their own personal ethics. And so a lot of what needs to change is local building standards and regulations. Meaning, of course, I want to root for people to do the right thing when they're buying a home and ask the right questions and be totally informed. But I think if we're relying too much on that, we run the risk of failure. This is why you have governments. This is why you have regulation, right? Is that not every consumer can make the right choice and internalize all the externalities of their decisions. Um, so very short answer to a very complicated question. I'm not sure I did it justice. Um, the, the, the second question, how do we attract the right talent? One, the talent's already being attracted. Where there's a shortfall is money, is r and I'll tell you what happens in an economy. Talent follows capital flows. It does. So if we increase the capital flows into climate tech, short as rain, the smartest talent in the economy will be attracted to that space. Not just because of the economics, but also because of their social conscience, right? The, the ethics of the decision. So everyone should be rooting for this. We want the best and brightest minds in our economy focused on solving the hardest problems for humanity's future. And this 
is number one, it's top of the list. So one of the things everyone should do is find a way to deploy more into R&D. The smartest minds are attracted to newness. They are attracted to technology. They are attracted to the future. And if being attracted to technology happens to be coincident with saving our planet, we are going to unlock like one of the greatest mobilizations of human cognitive power to solve this. But we have to make sure the capital flows correspondingly. And that's what I'm so focused on is I want to decarbonize the built world. I believe technology is a solution to doing that. I want to encourage more capital to flow into the space so that correspondingly, that brain power, that brilliance becomes focused on solving those real existential problems that also happen to have an economic benefit for real estate owners as well. And we're going to be right alongside you, my friend. Uh, Ash, I know it, we're going to get cut off. Can we make yeah. sure though, that everybody that asked a question, there's a lot in there in chat that we get a copy of those questions and we address them with Brendan and his team. Absolutely. Capacity, because we, we want to encourage this engagement. So uh, thank you. Uh, for, Absolutely. For taking and on that note, that is all the time we have for today's event. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Brendan, and our amazing audience. And thank you the, uh, to the Cretech team for all the backstage logistics and That's the fifth wall team for all the backstage logistics. Perfect. If you have, if you'd like to learn more about Cretech Climate, please visit www.cretech.com. Again, my name is Ashton Zandi, and it's been a pleasure to be your host today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ash. Thank you, Brendan. And, uh, this is the most important initiative of my, my personal, my professional career. And I, I couldn't be more thrilled to be doing it alongside you and many others that we're going to galvanize to support us. So thank you for all you're doing um, uh, to support Cretech, but more importantly, to, to change the world for the better, my friend. So thank you. And to the audience, I would leave you with the, uh, the words of the late, great, uh, very late uh, uh, Harry Chapin, who said, do something. Ditto. You know.